And while you're taking your seat, uh, if we could have the ushers come down, we will be studying God's Word, and it's important for you, I believe, to have the notes there in front of you. So uh, as the ushers come forward, if you haven't been able to get one of those outlines yet, if you would raise your hand, and they will get that to you. It is my pleasure to be able to speak to you. It's not the usual place where I'm speaking to our church. Uh, I'm usually speaking to a smaller part of our church over in the Heights and in the chapel as I teach them on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. But I love the opportunity to come here and sing with you and study God's Word with you. And if you're online, let me just say I'm sorry that you are missing out on the singing that's taking place here in this room. I tell you, I was um, just a moment ago, I was standing by uh, Tommy Chipman and I said, Man, the church is singing out today and it is a glorious sound. So I praise God for that. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you again to open up to Ephesians chapter 2. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 11 through 22. And I believe God has a message for us today. But before we jump into the text, let me just pray one more time, if if I may. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word and the clarity of your word. And Lord, today as we study it, I pray that you would unfold it before us. That we would see very clearly what you're saying to us through this passage of scripture. That we as Sheridan Hills Baptist Church would be stronger because of the study of this passage today. God, I pray that you would speak. And God, I pray that as we uh, hear your voice and study your word, God, we would not leave the same way as we came in. Lord, we thank you for the glorious Christ. We thank you for the gift of your son Jesus that changes our life, that gives us peace. And that helps us to have peace with others and peace with you. God, now as we look at your text, speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some of you may not know that at one point, uh, my wife and I were serving as missionaries in Africa. And as I was preparing this sermon and thinking about Jesus as our peace and peacemaker I began to think about a story that some of you may be familiar with. It's the Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda that have been fighting ever since the 1960s. Just three days ago, this picture surfaced. And this picture put salt once again into the womb between these two people. From the Rwandan genocide that was mentioned on the world stage. This is a picture from the French president, Emmanuel Macron, meeting with the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame. And the genocide took place in just 100 days in 1994. A report was released, and it just came out by a law firm, saying that France helped facilitate the massacre of, get this, 800,000 Tutsi people by arming and advising and protecting the Rwandan government, who in turn supported radical Hutu militia groups as they carried out their killings, claiming Hutu power. Now, France, along with other nations, ignored reports from Rwanda and did nothing to respond. The genocide ended when the Rwandan Patriotic Front overthrew the Hutu regime. And millions of Hutu traveled to get away from Rwanda, fearing retribution. As the refugees returned, trials were held to bring those guilty of war crimes to justice. And even, as I said, just a few days ago, outside agencies are still trying to help the Rwandans pursue justice and understand all that happened during the genocide, and pursue peace. Well, my brothers and sisters, today as we study this passage of Scripture, we're going to see that true peace comes from Jesus. True peace 
comes from the only true peacemaker, and that is Jesus Christ. Well, as we come to this story, there's a background that we need to understand. And if you follow along with me as you look at your outline, you'll see. The first thing is this, that Paul writes to the Ephesians to remind them that God's reconciliation in Christ requires believers to live a life worthy of the salvation that they have received. Now, many of you will know that Paul is writing here from prison. And he's in prison, interestingly enough, for bringing a Gentile into the temple. So here he's writing to help us to understand about peace and how we can have peace with one another and peace with God. In chapter 1, Paul describes spiritual blessings for believers and prays for them to know God. And now as we come to chapter 2, we're starting in verses 11 through 22, but verses 1 through 10, in verses 1 through 10, Paul shows us how God provides reconciliation through Christ. Verses 1 through 10 give us an individual reconciliation. And verses 11 through 22 show us a corporate reconciliation. Now, as we think of this passage, I want to kind of give you the main theme or the main idea of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And that's the box that's there on your paper. It says this, that God creates a new entity through Christ whose death reconciles us to God and to man. So as we think about this, let's look at what the passage has to say. Follow along as I read the passage. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the commandment, uh, covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And notice the bold there, verse 13. It's bold on your paper. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has, been made, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, that, we might create, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. In verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we, have, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then... What's the result of this? So then, verse 19 says, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Underline that. Strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens. Underline that. With the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole world, being joined together, grows into a, a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now I know this is a quite lengthy text, but as we look at this text, I believe this text has a lot to teach us about Jesus, our peace, and Jesus, the peacemaker. The first thing I would have you to note is this, that peace is not innate in people. Peace is not innate in people. As we look at verses 11 through 13, it's very clear what Paul is calling us to here is he's calling us 
to remember your condition before peace. And notice the wording that he uses here, specifically in verse 12. Notice the different description, different descriptions that he uses as he goes through the text. He says, one, you're separated from Christ. Two, alienated. He says, strange, we're strangers to the covenants of promise. We have no hope, had no hope, and without God in the world. Remembering our condition before peace is vitally important. And Paul here, as he points out our condition before we receive the peace from Christ, really paints a clear picture of the desperation of those around us. As we think about it, separated from Christ, meaning they have no part in Christ, that they will suffer the punishment for their own sin. They are alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The promises that were given to the children of Israel are not applied to those who do not know Christ, who don't have the peace of Christ. Strangers, it's interesting, alienated and strangers. There's a difference in wording there, and if you have a a pen, I would encourage you, as you think about the word alienated and thinking about the word stranger, an alien is one who lives in the land right beside others. But strangers are those who are just in a strange land and not necessarily living uh, next to or beside people who are um, in the land or who's citizens of the land. But here, as he paints this picture, he paints this fact that they have no hope and without God. On your outline, if you notice, there's, Revelation, uh, there's Romans 1.21, and it says this, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, before Christ, you may have known about God, but you didn't honor Him as God. And that's what Paul is describing here. But as we think about remembering a condition before peace, there's a second part here that we need to remember as well. And that is considering our condition or your condition with peace. You see, Paul makes a dramatic change here. If you look at the beginning of verse 13, he states it. He says, but now. So if you look at verses 11 and 12, what you find is he says, remember, remember. I underlined those for you on the outline. But if you notice, he says that at one time, in verse 11, and that you were at that time, he's talking about the past. But in verse 13, he says, but now. The present reality that we have now. The present reality is this. That in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see the present reality? It's the, it is a present that has been decisively shaped by Christ's actions in the past. So as we consider our current condition and as we think about and remember our condition in the past, before peace, it's important for us to think about this as we think about Jesus as our peace and Jesus being our peacemaker. Now it seems as though, and I was mentioning this to uh, someone as I was studying this passage, it seems that this is is kind of stuck on the front of this, but it really doesn't make sense. But I believe that Paul does call us to remember for four different reasons. And these reasons are down at the bottom of your page, if you notice. You see, what laws and ordinances and ceremonies and sacrifices and good deeds could not do to make peace with God, Jesus did. But as we remember these things... One, remembering reminds us of a condition of people who have yet to believe. It helps us to kind of get perspective of those that are around us who have yet to believe the truth of the gospel. 
But secondly, remembering clarifies the difference that Christ has made in our life. Notice Paul, as he points this out, you're separated from Christ. Remember that situation. But he says, now, present tense, you are in Christ. And there's a marked difference there. It clarifies that difference when we remember the past and think about the present and what God has done in our life for those who have trusted in Christ. Third, remembering helps us to think clearly about ourselves. It helps us to think clearly about ourselves. And I would encourage you, if you're taking notes, take your pen and write beside that humility. Because what happens here is we remember our past. We remember we are no better than anyone else that has yet to trust in Christ. That we, at one point, had no hope. We were desperate and destitute. But God, being rich in mercy, as it says early in the book of Ephesians, and because of his great love for us, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. And that helps us to clarify our thinking about ourself, not to think too highly of ourself, because it's not about us, it's about him and who he is. And fourth, remembering the past makes the present that much sweeter, doesn't it? It makes it that much sweeter that we can go, yes, I remember the desperate hopelessness that I was facing. But now, what a tremendous blessing that God has done in sending Jesus and saving my soul. So, As I said at the beginning, we need to remember that peace is not innate in people. But as you turn the page over, I do want to remind you, if you look on the second part there, I I picked up in verse 14 through the end of the the chapter. The second thing we see here is this, that peace is provided by Christ. Peace is provided by Christ. And as we go through this text, what we find is what Christ did in accomplishing our peace, how did he secure our peace, and why he provided peace. And it's all right here in the text. Notice what it says. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Circle that. Because that is the crux of this text. Jesus is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances. And the result, why did he do it? That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. And there's a second result there, a second reason why in verse 16. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So what did he do in accomplishing our peace? Well, he brought together entities by removing what divides If you notice in the text, there's twice that the word hostility is used. It's the dividing wall of hostility. And later on in verse 16, it says, killing the hostility. Now, the best way for me to illustrate this to you and what Christ did and how he accomplished our peace is to use an example of something that uh, ruins exist, but yet uh, I want to take you back to the day of Herod's temple and the temple mount you'll notice it here i know it's kind of small on the screen i'll blow it up here in a second but i want you to get the total picture of the temple mount what you see is the royal portico you see it on the left there and then as you look at the other part of the middle you see the holy of holies and the temple mount the surrounding part okay but let me blow that up for you and give you this picture Here, as we look at Herod's temple, the next picture there. Now, as we think about it, here's what I want you to see. Paul here references 
in verse 14, the dividing wall of hostility. Well, if you were to look there at the focus part of Herod's temple, what you'll notice is you think about the first picture, the Gentiles' courtyard was there on the Temple Mount, but there was a very clear distinction between where Gentiles could go and where Jews could go. And if you look at this little, uh, this zoomed-in picture here, you can see a little wall that goes around the temple, and there's holes or there's, there's gaps in that wall. Well, that little wall was about a four-foot wall that was to mark and clearly divide where the Jews could go and where the Gentiles could go. In fact, there was such clear distinction and no one wanted any confusion about it that they actually put up signs to tell, to tell others that they could not go past that. Tell Jews, I mean, sorry, Gentiles that they could not go past it. Look at this. This is a picture of one of those markings that was there it, that has been discovered and is currently in the museum in Istanbul. Now, I don't know how many of you can read it. Uh, it's Greek to me. But uh, it does say this. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. And whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death. Which will follow. So there was a clear distinction between the two groups. The Gentiles could only come to a certain part of the temple, and the Jews could enter into another part. Can you go back to that picture of the temple there? So you see the women's courtyard, there was a specific place where the women could enter, and then from there, where uh, men, Jewish men, could enter. So you see that there. But remember what I said at the very beginning. I said, what did he accomplish? Or how did he accomplish our peace? Or what did he do to accomplish our peace? I said, he brought together entities by removing what divides. Well, verse 14 has the word hostility. It's speaking the hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. But verse 16 is interesting because that hostility there is speaking about the division between God and man. And again, to give you a clear picture and understanding of the division that exists there, I take you into the inner part of the temple, the holy place. And if you remember, in the holy place, there was the table of showbread, there were the golden lampstands in the inner part of the temple, but there was a very clear distinction between the holy place and the holy of holies. And the picture you see there is this distinction. And if you remember, the distinction there was the veil, right? And the veil was to mark the, the, the division between man and God. Well, you also remember what Christ did. When he died on the cross... For your sins, he, the, what happened was the veil split in two, right? Splitting from top to bottom. Showing, as Pastor Andrew has pointed out to those of you that are in starting point, and those of you that have been through starting point, that God became a man so that we can be right with him. Well, here is a picture of that division, and again, what did Christ accomplish, or how did he accomplish our peace? It was by dying on the cross for our sins. But as we think about this, it's not just what did he accomplish, but also how did he secure our peace? Well, this text tells us exactly how he secured our peace. It says, verse 15, "...by abolishing the law of the commandments." Uh, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. So abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. Abolishing. Another way to think about that word, and maybe you should write it off to the side, is he made the law inoperative, making it have no effect and having no 
no force. Making it have no effect and no force. You see, the law was put to death, the law was not put to death or destroyed, but has been nullified for the believer. The teeth have been taken out of it, so to speak, for the believer. Why? Because Christ has fulfilled it, and it is no longer has effect or force on the believer, no matter whether they're Gentile or Jewish believer who is in Christ. Because Christ is the end of the law for believers. Again, if you're writing, I didn't put this reference in your outline, but I would encourage you to write this down. Romans 10, 4 says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see, Christ fulfilled the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 Christ said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And as believers, we are no longer under the penalty of the law. Galatians 3, 23-26, Paul writing and addressing this issue of the Galatians wanting to turn uh, people into more Jewish than into into Christ. So Paul addresses this in the book of Galatians. He says this, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. Now listen to this, Galatians 3, 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And verse 26 says, For Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. You see, it's faith. So how did Jesus secure our peace? Well, by fulfilling the law, by rendering it inoperative, by causing the law to have no effect on the believer, no force on the believer, not to be under the penalty of sin. And why did he provide peace? Well, he provided peace because, as the end of verse 15 says, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two and might reconcile us both to God in one body. So why did he provide peace? He desired to create a new people and make them right with God. Now as we think about the word new, circle that word there on verse 15, a new man. That word new there is is new in quality. It's a new quality of something which has not existed before. You see, it's not that what happened was Christ made uh, the Jewish believer and the Gentile believer. No, what Christ did is he made a third entity where Jewish believers and Gentile believers in Christ fully accept one another because they are all part of one new entity. You get it? The best way I can describe this to you is this. As we think about it, they're not a Jewish believer or a Gentile believer. In this room, it's not a Bahamian believer or a Romanian believer. It's not a New Yorkian believer or an Alabamian believer. It is a believer, a new entity, and a new, with a new identity. And the identity is not based on what you were before Christ. It's based on faith in Christ. You understand? So it's important for us. They're not Jews or Gentiles, but a body of Christians who make up this new entity. And this new entity is seen or displayed in the church. And this creates unity in the church. 
This creates unity in us because we realize we are all in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. We have died to the law, and thus we are reconciled and made into a new entity, and that new entity is reconciled to God. It's amazing as you think about it. Paul says it again in another place in 1 Corinthians 5, 18. It says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul continues in the book of 1 Corinthians 5 because he says this, And he has made us ambassadors. As God were making his appeal in, uh, through us. So as we think about that, and as we think about the peace that was provided by Christ, and as recipients of that peace, those who are in Christ, we need to be reminded that peace is to be preached to all. Peace is to be preached to all. Notice what Paul says as we go back to the text and look at verse 17. And he came... And preach peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. Now, as you think about the ministry of Christ, his preaching was to Jews. But yet, by extension, before he ascended to heaven, he said, All authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission. And he gave the Great Commission, and in the book of Acts, the book of Acts starts in Acts 1.8 with a very explanation similar to that very Great Commission. And then from there we see the word in Acts spread like wildfire among Gentiles. Well, you see, peace is to be preached to all. Why? Because salvation is for anyone who trusts in Christ. Salvation is for anyone who trusts in Christ. The point of the message is not the invention of the, pa- of the preacher, but the proclamation of what is handed down. And that is the truth of the gospel and salvation. Is The message of peace is not just for the Gentile, those who are without Christ, alienated from Israel, but also for the unredeemed Jew who knew the covenants of promise, who had some bit of hope because of their ethnic connection and an understanding. They had some understanding of God, even though it was not a full understanding of God. So it was that God provided this message of salvation to those who were peace to those who were far off, that would be referring to the Gentiles, but also peace to those who were near, who were near, and those were the Jews. But the second thing we see here about peace is to be preached to all. It's through Christ alone that we have access to God. That word access is the word, to carry the idea of that word access, you can draw a line to it and and point this out, that access is freedom to approach. It is that God has provided access to himself through Jesus. And the emphasis in that verse is through him. In Christ, we have a way of access We have entrance to the sovereign, the Father. Because of Christ's work, God is approachable. And without Christ's work, sinful humans could not approach God. But it's interesting as you look at that verse there that we're referring to, verse 18, 
Isn't it interesting that for through him we have access in one spirit to the Father? In that verse alone, we see the triune God at work in giving us access. Through Christ, the work of Christ, united in one spirit, believing Jews and Gentiles have access to the Father. Right off to the side of that, First Peter, well, it's, it's there, First Peter 3, 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for, the, for sins, the righteous for unrighteous, that he might bring us to God and put to death in the flesh. Being put to death in the flesh, sorry, but made alive in the Spirit. You see, we have access. John 14, 6. You know that, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, access is granted only through Christ. Again, as I thought about this illustration, thought about this um, aspect of, of access to Christ, I went back to my missionary days of being in Africa. Kelly and I spent about a week living in a tent in a, a Bimba land because we were trying to learn the language of Bimba. And so uh, we spent a full week there basically doing immersion learning in the Bimba language. One of the aspects that I remember most out of that time when we were camping out during that, that week was when we went to go visit Chief. We went to visit Chief Chisabunga in Chinsali, Zambia. But our language tutor, the one that was there to help us to understand the cultural differences between the two, he said, but you have to listen. Before we go to see the chief, one, you have to follow a certain protocol, and two, you have to bring gifts. And the gifts would gain and give you access to the chief. So as I remember, we took multiple chickens and also some money to the chief and gave it to his messenger so the messenger could then take it to the chief. And as the chief then accepted the gift, then we were granted access to speak to the chief. Well, that's the picture of what we have here, that we have access to the Father, to the God of the universe, the sovereign king of all, through the blood of Jesus, through what Christ has done. United in one spirit, we have access to the Father. So this truth should be preached to all. And Paul says it very clearly. It's not You don't pick and choose who you share it with. You share it with all, with everyone. And as we come to the latter part of this text, here's where I really want to speak to you, church. The latter part of this text, as we look at verses 19 through 22, is this, that peace is to be lived out in community. It's not an individual thing. You don't just get the peace and you go and, and trust in Christ, and then you live on your own, not in community. No, you're made to live in community. The first thing I would have you to note there is this, that believers, this is believers sharing in a new relationship. Notice the wording that he uses in verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Remember what I said? Where you're disconnected. Various degrees of disconnection. That's there. Strangers are just people in the land that don't have any connection really in the land. And the aliens are those who may have connections, but yet they don't have the rights of citizenship from the land. Well, here, what we find is Paul tells us, but you are fellow citizens. So you were, at one time, you were strangers. But now you have a new relationship. You are fellow citizens. And as fellow citizens, I put this here, Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Notice what it says. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You see, we've been given a new relationship. No longer are we strangers and aliens, but we are now fellow citizens. And as fellow citizens, those who are in Christ all share the same rights and privileges. But notice also believers belonging to a new structure, the church. This is a picture of believers belonging to a new structure, the church. As he says, you are fellow citizens, he begins to lay out for us the idea of what this structure really looks like. So as you follow along, notice the structure. It is a real family. It's a real family. He says in verse 19 that you are fellow citizens with, saint, with the saints and members of the household of God. We're members of the household of God. Scripture numerous times points out the fact that we are sons of God. And therefore, as sons, we're part of the family. And as part of the family, we have brothers and sisters. Oftentimes, people would say, oh, brothers and sisters, listen to me, right? Well, it's because we are part of a real family. Well, you may be struggling today. Some, as I was praying through this message, I was really thinking about those who are facing loneliness and difficulty and feel like they're not really connected. Can I say, lean into the church and let the church be your family. Don't just visit occasionally. Lean in and be a part of the family. For those of you who are visiting with us, I encourage you, don't just come one time and leave. You know, I call that one and done. Don't just be one and done. Come again and again and again so you can hear the Word of God clearly proclaimed. So you can make connections with a church family because this is a real family. Now, I know each one of us has our, our own biological families, but just consider this a great big extended family with crazy cousins and everything else. <laughs> we are a real family. But secondly, think about this. It has a sure foundation. Notice what it says in the text. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets. To me, that the speaking to is that the church is built on the foundation of God's word. And faithfully proclaiming God's Word, studying God's Word, that's why we read it before the service begins. That's why we study it as the service begins. And those of you that are missing growth group at 9 o'clock, you need to go to growth group at 9 o'clock because that's where we also digest the Word together. But we have a sure foundation. It has a sure foundation. The church has a sure foundation. Not only that, it is centered on Jesus. It's centered on Jesus. Notice what it says Cry, in verse 20, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, what is the cornerstone? Have you ever seen a cornerstone? If you haven't seen a cornerstone, walk out those doors right there, and when you go out the ministry center foyer, you'll see a cornerstone for the ministry center. And what does that cornerstone mean? represent or mean well it's the center it's the focus of hey we've laid this foundation we've built this building for this very reason and might I say the church has been built on Christ for the worship and glory of Christ to proclaim it to a lost and dying world it's centered on Jesus but not only is it centered on Jesus, it is a close-knit community. It's a close-knit community. You may say, close-knit community? What are you talking about? Well, look at what it says in verse 21. In whom the whole structure 
being joined together, grows into a temple in the Lord. In Him, you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The phrases being joined together and the other phrase being built together, these speak to the fact of what Pastor Ben was speaking earlier about. Yes, it's no secret, my family loves to do puzzles, and now all of you know that because of Pastor Ben. Thank you, Pastor Ben. (laughs) But here, as we think about this being joined together, it's the picture of a puzzle. As you put a puzzle together, you're building a beautiful mosaic, right? And each piece fits exactly together, right? And, by the way, when you put it together, it's hard to pull it apart, right? So here as we think about being joined together, the idea is that it's a close joining. It's an interlocking, if you will. And the church is made to be that way. It's made to be a close-knit community. That's why we drive home again and again. Yes, Koinonia Wednesdays don't mean vacation from church. Koinonia Wednesdays are strategic in us continuing on in our close-knit community, being joined together closely knowing about each and every person that you meet with and learning the body, this church that you've been joined to. So don't skip out on Cornelia Wednesdays. And by the way, you don't have to just do it on Wednesday. We talked about this in pastor's meeting. You know, it can be Cornelia Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? But let's take time and intentionality and continue to develop a close-knit community and being joined or sorry being built together it's a one by one thing it's a structure that's built one stone at a time and if you're noticing what the text says it's not that the stone is deciding where it goes into the picture It's being built by something or someone else. And that is, it's being built by God. Two more points I want you to see, and that's this. It is a closely, I mean, sorry, it is continuously growing. The church is continuously growing. Now, I want you to get out of your mind the idea of individual growth. Because what this text is emphasizing is the idea of corporate growth. And the church growing together corporately, learning God's Word together, growing together as a family, but also growing together in God's Word corporately. Thus again, can I reiterate to you the importance of you not just coming on a Sunday morning to the worship service and leaving and saying, I've done my job for the week. It's a growing, continuously growing community. And so I encourage you, come on Wednesdays. We are talking about issues in which you face as soon as you walk out the doors of this church. Come on Sunday morning in growth group. By the way, growth group starts at 9 o'clock. Great, okay? Not 9.30. Come to growth group. Again, so a close-knit community can grow collectively in God's Word. And lastly, it has a spiritual purpose. Notice the spiritual purpose in the end. It says, verse 21, it grows in, in the latter part of verse 21, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And the latter part of verse 22 being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So this spiritual purpose that we have is to grow as a holy temple in our worship of the Lord and 
to grow into being a permanent dwelling place of God. Scripture says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them also. So don't miss the importance of believers belonging to this new structure, the church. So as we come to the conclusion of this text, I remind you again of the premise that I started at the very beginning, the main idea of this text. God creates a new entity. I submit to you, it's the church through Christ whose death reconciles us to God and to man. Or to God and to one another. So some key questions I have for you as we think about this text. First is this. Are you trusting in the work of Christ to give you peace with God? Are you here this morning and you hear me talk about peace and you look at your life and you realize you have no peace? May I say to you today, submit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize what Christ has done in dying on the cross for your sins. And remember, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. But secondly, I have another question for you, and that's this. Do you faithfully share Christ with others? Here, the scripture is very clear that Peace is to be preached. It's not for us to become believers and say, okay, I've got Jesus, now good, and just hide him and hold him and, and, and not share what Christ has done and how Christ has transformed your life with others. No, it's meant to share. What Christ has done for you is meant to share. So how are you doing? Are you faithfully sharing Christ with others? Are there those in your families when you leave this place and go home to whom you need to share Christ with? Are there those at work that you see every day that you need to share Christ with? School's out. For some of you, but for some others of you, are there those in your class that you need to share Christ with? Are you faithfully sharing Christ? And the last question I have for you is this. Do you only attend church on Sunday and do not connect with people during the week? From what I see in this passage of Scripture and how God has created us in Christ to live in community with one another, if you're a Sunday morning only Christian, you're not following what God desires of you to live in community. Maybe you're visiting the church today, and maybe today's the first day, and you're like, Wait, what is this church all about? Well, I encourage you, continue to lean in. Come find out what sweet community we have here. And do you connect with members or with people during the week? I encourage you, take some time. Spend time with others. Get to know the person that's sitting on the pew beside you. Maybe get to know the person that's in your growth group class. Maybe get to know the person that you've never seen before. At the end of the service, as we do the two-minute roll, make a beeline for somebody that you... Don't recognize and introduce yourself and see how you can connect with them as we share in sweet community together. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.